Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, and in this episode, we explore the themes of love, lust, forgiveness, and redemption in Emily Bronte's greatest novel, Withering Heights. Emily Bronte's Withering Heights is considered by many to be a passionate love story, a tale of love that is stronger than death, centering around the generational story of Catherine Earnshaw, an orphan young man turned tyrannical master Heathcliff, and a young, headstrong Kathy Linton, who uncovers the tragedy of Withering Heights in her dealings with an older Heathcliff that entangles her in a multi-generational struggle of love, lust, and redemption. The reading of Withering Heights as a love story, principally between Catherine and Heathcliff, is, however, deeply misconstrued and extremely dangerous, especially when you only focus on Catherine and Heathcliff because you ignore the entire second half of the novel. There is a love story that moves the plot, the love of Kathy toward Linton and Hareton, the compassion and mercy and forgiveness that she exhibits in those relationships, not the erotic demons of Heathcliff and Catherine, which cast their destructive shadows over the Welsh moorlands of Withering Heights. The so-called love of Heathcliff and Catherine serves as a warning to the reader. The love of Cathy, meanwhile, serves as the healing and redemptive antidote to the original sin of Heathcliff and Catherine, and two different types of love the story tells with degenerate moderns falling in love with the warning Bronte was preaching and rejecting the very love that she preaches to bring forgiveness, redemption, and restoration to a world suffering from tyranny, death, and destruction. It is fashionable for postmodern and feminist critics to laud the supposed love of Catherine and Heathcliff. They also highlight the headstrong, confrontational spirit of Cathy to Heathcliff in the second half of the novel, if they ever bother to go that far at all. The reason for these ideological re readings are rather obvious. Catherine, as a woman, acts on her own agency regarding love, though she dies, rather than remaining submissive to the structures and forces surrounding her. Kathy, as a young adult, also acts on her own agency in confronting Heathcliff the toxic male overlord, and comes out victorious. Furthermore, the romanticization of Eros exhibited by Catherine and Heathcliff allow one to brush aside the more obvious critiques and warnings Emily Bronte inserts into the storyline. In an early encounter between Catherine and Heathcliff, for example, Heathcliff rebuffs you needn't have touched me. I shall be as dirty as I please, and I like to be dirty, and I will be dirty. This declaration is hardly something to ignore, but ignore our critics do in focusing on the romanticized love of Catherine and Heathcliff. What does dirty mean here when Heathcliff declares that statement? Heathcliff, of course, as any sensible reader of the novel knows, is a sinner. He is a darkened soul, not later in life, but as early as a child. Heathcliff's dusky fingers and dirty self-confession reveal his character and his soul to the reader. He is a danger to Catherine and will be the death of Catherine. His dirtiness among the dirtiness of many characters in the story, will cast its destructive spirit over withering heights. Catherine's inability to control her passions 
and Heathcliff's manipulative ability to turn Catherine's spirit of compassion into a maelstrom of emotions is what leads to her early death. But focusing on how the false love of Heathcliff and Catherine is a form of dirty lust and sin, and how the merciful compassion of Kathy Hinton is the redemptive antidote that breaks the original sin of Heathcliff and Catherine smacks too much of theology and implicit Christianity for modern interpreters who would rather the story be a tragedy about erotic love, Heathcliff and Catherine, and the triumph of the militant feminine, Kathy, rather than the merciful compassion of Kathy's agency, which breaks the curse and the sin of Heathcliff and Catherine. For that is what the story is actually about, that all serious scholars knew until the 1970s, and that we are focusing on in this lecture, because it adds to the majesty, the beauty, and the power of Emily Bronte's great work. And frankly, it is a message that all of us living in the 21st century should take to heart, for a greater world of merciful compassion is certainly needed. For Kathy to fall into a feminine model of merciful compassion to postmodern readers and feminist critics also means that she would lose her agency. Au contraire, it is precisely Kathy's freedom to exert her merciful compassion against all of the forces working against her that is her greatest triumph, and Emily's point in the progressive characterization and development of Kathy's storyline. Emily Bronte's feminism is not the feminism of the 1960s and the 1970s. Emily Bronte's feminism is in female agency as agency, not necessarily in the combative and headstrong spirit of voluntaristic equity or female ascension over male subjugation, as so many of the horrendous feminist critics read, but Kathy's freedom to choose mercy and compassion and to break down the walls of tyranny and the barriers that restrict her the same walls, barriers, and restrictions that led to the death of Catherine in the first half of the novel is her ultimate triumph. It is something that she chose against all the restrictions, against all the forces working against her. Kathy's freedom to choose mercy and compassion is what brings redemption to Withering Heights by the end of the novel. I find Withering Heights to be a triumph of the modern feminine reality. The elevation of female agency against male and social institutional subjugation, which is self-evident, and that is the one thing that feminist critics do tend to still retain and understand. But in doing so, the idea of elevating female agency while retaining the desire for family, marriage, and consummated love and two flesh brought together as one to bring life into the world, which is exactly how the story ends, is a bit of a bridge too far for feminist critics. They don't want to talk about that part of the story and instead only want to focus on the first part of Kathy's female agency against Heathcliff. The story is a triumph of feminine compassion emerging in a dark, destructive world and everything arrayed against it. Yet, despite all of that, despite all the forces arrayed against it, Kathy's feminine compassion still emerges and brings redemption to a land in destruction. What Emily Bronte achieves is the freedom for females to be females the freedom of the feminine to assert its own femininity rather than be coerced to accept its own nature by social and institutional pressures, as happens with Catherine, which does cause her death. This is what modern critics all miss, and deliberately so, because their ideological criticism rejects nature as nature and is grounded 
by a metaphysic of rebellion. Because their axiom for literary interpretation is the metaphysic of rebellion, it comes as no surprise that their heroes are the rebels, Heathcliff and Catherine, and that Cathy is heroic only insofar as she rebels against Heathcliff, ignoring, through this reading, the true heroism of Cathy in her feminine compassion for Linton and Hareton, despite the tyranny of Heathcliff bearing down on her. Let us begin then with the false love of Catherine and Heathcliff, so we can see how the romanticized reading of their relationship is completely against the very story and the novel that Emily Bronte wrote. I have asserted that this story serves as a warning. The story of Catherine and Heathcliff serves as a warning. Emily Bronte's in situ novelization of the Christian idea of the fall and original sin, which casts its dark shadow over withering heights and prevents its original Edenic beauty from shining forth in all of its splendor, which we will see very briefly at the end of the novel. Withering Heights should be a serene place. It is situated in the beauty of the Welsh moors. Its landscape is that of a garden paradise, a castle of life. Yet it is beset by problems which prevent that serenity from being seen. In contrast to its neighbors, Thrushcross Grange, for instance, Rithering Heights is a dark and dangerous place. It is a place of death and destruction. Why is Withering Heights a dark and dangerous place? We mustn't forget that the story is told in flashback through the arrival of Mr. Lockwood and the storytelling memories of Nellie Dean. The narrative begins post-fall. We are in a post-lapsarian world and we learn through the framed narrative and the memorial storytelling of Nellie of how it all began. Heathcliff may have had a tragic backstory, but he does nothing to change that fact. As mentioned, he declares himself dirty and that he will always be dirty. He is later upbraided for taking joy in the misery and pain of others and how he can extract revenge against Hindley. For shame, Heathcliff, it is for God to punish wicked people. We should learn to forgive, Nellie recalls in speaking to Mr. Lockwood about a young and rebellious Heathcliff. She also recalls Heathcliff's response. No, God won't have the satisfaction that I shall have. From Nellie's reminiscences, we realize Heathcliff is an ungodly man, a sinner, a man who takes unto himself what is due to the love that structures the cosmos and orders the spirit of nature, for God is love. He is a Lucifer, a fallen child and a man from a former beauty and grandeur that refuses to change and exists only in opposition to others. His existence is in separation rather than unity, hate rather than love. True, Hindley is no saint either. Hindley is an abusive hindrance that taunts and harms the young Heathcliff. But by living out an eye for an eye, rather than turning the other cheek, Heathcliff's desire for revenge and his own brutality helps to destroy withering heights. He is a man who by his own confession will not forgive. This seductive rebel is also the fancy of Catherine Earnshaw. The young Catherine is caught between the social norms of her environment, particularly her prospective expectation to marry Edgar Linton, and the erotic temptation of Heathcliff, the fallen angel, come to bring death and destruction to Withering Heights. To be more like Heathcliff entails becoming the dark and sinister rebel that he is. To marry Edgar is conceived as capitulation to social and institutional pressures that rob Catherine of her freedom. Though she marries Edgar at the expense of Heathcliff, it is also clear from the narrative that she did 
have erotic desire for Heathcliff. She was not in a zero-sum game. She chose, in an interior sense, to be more like Heathcliff while maintaining the facade of social expectations in Marianne Edgar. Critics who assert that her coerced acceptance of Edgar spelled doom miss the fact that she was always beside Heathcliff, watching Heathcliff, and mimicking Heathcliff. She became Heathcliff as she herself exclaims to Nelly, My greatest thought in living is Heathcliff. If all else perished and he remained, I shall still continue to be. Nelly, I am Heathcliff. He always, always is in my mind. As she also says, I have no more business to marry Edgar Linton than I have to be in heaven. Catherine, in choosing Heathcliff at an interior spiritual level, confesses that she is abandoning heaven for Heathcliff's world of bodily torment and torrent, the cruelty and the violence that is entailed in that relationship. What makes Catherine a remarkable character is that she is conscious of it all. She openly and willingly and knowingly chooses Heathcliff and all the ramifications that her choice entails. She recognizes it. As she says, I have no more business to marry Edgar Linton than I have to be in heaven. She openly wants to be cast out of heaven for Heathcliff's hell. And in doing exactly that, despite the outward marriage with Edgar, the heaven, the paradise of withering heights, turns into a hell. Her choice, like Eve's in Genesis, leads to death, not merely her own, but a death that extends to the land around her and all of withering heights, which is tainted by that free choice to engage in lust, sin, and death. But the desecration of Withering Heights and the death of Catherine Earnshaw isn't the end of the story. Heathcliff grows up and inherits the castle. He confronts his adolescent bullies and bullies them in turn. He is now the tyrannical master of a dying, decadent place. Kathy Linton the daughter of Catherine Earnshaw and Edgar Linton comes to Withering Heights to fulfill Heathcliff's declaration that he wishes to be haunted by Catherine. Catherine Earnshaw, may you not rest as long as I am living. You said I killed you. Haunt me then. The murdered do haunt their murderers. I believe I know that ghosts have wandered on the earth. Be with me always. Take any form. Drive me mad. Only do not leave me in this abyss where I cannot find you. Oh God, it is unutterable. I cannot live without my life. I cannot live without my soul. So Kathy Linton appears. The spirit of Catherine Earnshaw, in many ways, come to haunt Heathcliff and fulfill his dark desires. And the curse he called down upon himself. That famous phrase, that moment of declaration that Heathcliff proclaims as Catherine dies is not a proclamation of love as all the feminist and romantic interpreters read. It is a calling down of a curse. I know that ghosts have wandered on the earth. Be with me always. Take any form. Drive me mad. And that, of course, is exactly what happens when Kathy Linton comes to fulfill the curse he called upon himself. What precipitated this dramatic outburst, of course, as we've mentioned, was Catherine's death, but also her want for forgiveness. Forgive me, she cries to Heathcliff on her deathbed. Catherine's wish for forgiveness is refused by Heathcliff. Forgiveness is a bridge too far, for it would clean him of his filth, his dirtiness, that he gleefully rolls in and enjoys. Recall Nellie's conversation with a young Heathcliff about learning to forgive. Heathcliff cannot. 
So he rejects reconciliation through forgiveness and causes the darkness descending upon withering heights to plunge further into death and hell. After Catherine's death, he calls upon the curse of sin to consume him for the rest of his life. The second half of the novel brings forth the resolution to this problem of refusal to forgive, for that is what Emily Bronte's great novel is now about, how forgiveness brings redemption and restoration to a land and to people who refused it earlier in life. Kathy's appearance in the novel serves as the second half of the story, the part of the story often forgotten in public memory, and, and the eulogization of Bronte's great novel, which is usually only the first half. The famous film, for instance, only concentrates on the first half of the novel and not the second half. Kathy is not only the fulfillment of Heathcliff's dark desire to be haunted, she is also the antidote to the original sin of Withering Heights, the lack of compassion and forgiveness exhibited between Catherine and Heathcliff, between Heathcliff and Hinley, between all the individuals who couldn't manifest that spirit of compassion and forgiveness when most needed. But Catherine, or Kathy, is no saint at the beginning of her storyline, and rightly so, for it makes her transfiguration all the more potent and memorable, indeed admirable and unforgettable. Again, Emily Bronte's genius is in Kathy's free choice to be a woman, to embrace the feminine mystique of compassion, mercy, and love that has been absent in this dark, toxic world of withering heights since Heathcliff's arrival and his presence bringing the taint of death and destruction into it. She falls into the coercive machinations of Heathcliff initially and acts snobbishly toward the uneducated Hareton. Toward Linton Heathcliff, Kathy is caught in an abusive trap with Linton's outbursts and compassionate allure toward his weakly state, whilst prodded by Heathcliff's machinations to marry the two, she is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Kathy does seem to fall in love with the dying Linton, but mostly to spite Heathcliff, to prove that she is stronger than Heathcliff's tormenting oppression. Linton, however, dying of tuberculosis, eventually dies, freeing Kathy of the tyrannical lordship of Heathcliff, which permits Kathy's free embrace of her femininity in standing up to Heathcliff and coming to love Hareton, whom she had acted callously toward earlier upon her first arrival. Linton's death also frees her to love without the motivation of spite toward Heathcliff, but even her love of Linton, which she does confess, was important in the beginning of her transfiguration. We'll come back to this in a moment. Kathy's complex relationship with Hareton reveals her inner soul and transformation. She does act snobbishly toward his lack of education at the beginning of their relationship, but she grows to have compassion toward his unfortunate disposition. Hareton is weak where Kathy is strong, and Kathy's strength will give Hareton strength. In time, Kathy takes merciful pity and compassion on Hareton, his disposition, his weakness, and decides to help him, despite Heathcliff. But in spiting Heathcliff, she genuinely begins to love Hareton, who experiences a mystical and powerful force he has never experienced thus far in his life. An experience that Withering Heights has also lacked since the beginning of the story upon Heathcliff's presence in the area. Kathy becomes a teacher for Hareton. She helps him in his education. The two do fall in love with each other, a love that was the outgrowth of Kathy's feminine compassion and mercy, which breaks Heathcliff's heart of stone. 
Under the vindictive gaze of Heathcliff, Kathy exhibits her love in a world bereft of love. Heathcliff's gaze over the love between Kathy and Hareton makes him realize of the love he missed with Catherine because of his inability to forgive. Heathcliff still is unable to forgive, so he dies, but his death ends the dark curse that had ensnared Withering Heights, which allows Kathy to escape the miserable shadow and tyranny of Heathcliff, which inhibited her full total transfiguration. So long as Heathcliff is around, there is the terrible possibility of relapse. But what makes Kathy a heroine is her knowledge of the power of compassion and forgiveness that she willingly chooses to exhibit. In confronting Heathcliff about her love of Linton before he died, she states, I know he has a bad nature. He's your son. But I'm glad I've a better, that I've been better to forgive it. And I know he loves me. And for that reason, I love him. Mr. Heathcliff, you have nobody to love you. But she also acknowledges an ulterior motivation within this moving declaration of compassion and love. However miserable you make us, she says, we shall still have the revenge of thinking that your cruelty arises from your greater misery. You are miserable, are you not? Lonely, like the devil, and envious like him. While Kathy's love for Linton has peripheral motivations that are subsequently freed upon his death, permitting her entirely self-giving love to Hareton later in the story, her confrontation with Heathcliff during her love of Linton reveals many things that modern critics gloss over or deliberately ignore. First is the theme of forgiveness that we've been talking about, the very quality of love that Heathcliff refuses to embrace even as Catherine lay dying and wished for his forgiveness. Kathy forgives Heathcliff for his miserable tyranny, which sets her on the path for the transfiguring forgiveness between her and Hareton toward the novel's conclusion. Second, and most importantly, she correctly identifies Heathcliff as Lucifer, a devil, envious and lonely, just like Milton's Satan in Paradise Lost, who is miserable and envious upon espying the joyful love of our first parents in paradise. Third, Kathy understands that love entails relationships and that loneliness can never produce the love that humans seek and that forgiveness seems to be an alluring and uniting, a uniting force that brings people together in love. Forgiveness is very much part of the essential spirit of love, which is why Heathcliff and Catherine could not consummate their love. Kathy's agency doesn't change. The purpose of her agency does, and in the direction of the agency of Catherine and Kathy is what Emily Bronte calls us to all consider. From spiting Heathcliff to loving Hareton, Kathy's freedom is found in her choices, but Emily Bronte extols the consummation of Kathy's freedom in choosing to love Hareton with compassion, mercy, and pity, with full knowledge of what her love means and entails in the world, this world of death and destruction. Rather than the self-centered love of Catherine Earnshaw, which caused her death, and the selfish envy that governs Heathcliff, leading to his desire for vengeance. In loving Hareton and exhibiting the compassionate mercy and love that such relationship demanded, Kathy's manifestation of love causes Heathcliff to be broken and ultimately destroyed. His death 
a result of Kathy's agency, her agency of mercy, compassion, and forgiveness, frees Withering Heights from the dark curse hanging over it. In the penultimate transfiguration of Kathy, she kisses Hareton on the cheeks as the image of compassion for her earlier torment of the boy. She asks for forgiveness, knowing that forgiveness is not a one-way street. She has learned forgiveness in dealing with Heathcliff, but now must experience forgiveness from the agency of Hareton to absolve her of her earlier crimes. Say you forgive me, Hareton, do. You can make me so happy by speaking that little word. Hareton initially hesitates, but eventually forgives. Forgiveness, that ultimate expression of Christian love, triumphs over withering heights and brings love and life into the world, a world previously inhabited by death and destruction. Kathy and Hareton eventually marry. Their love, consummated in marriage, is brought forth by that spirit of forgiveness. The very things missing in the relationship of Heathcliff and Catherine. And because of that love brought, by, brought about by forgiveness, the beauty, the original beauty of Withering Heights is restored. Peace has come at long last. We have the promise of new life in the newly serene world. I lingered around them under that benign sky, watched the moths fluttering among the heath and harebells, listen to the soft wind breathing through the grass, and wondered how anyone could ever imagine unquiet slumbers for the sleepers in that quiet earth. I wonder how anyone could ever imagine that the love between Catherine and Heathcliff is what Emily Bronte was praising instead of the love of Kathy in her compassion, mercy, and forgiveness that undoes the original sin of Heathcliff's refusal of forgiveness and Catherine's choice to be the devil Heathcliff instead of the angel we are all called to be and that Kathy singularly becomes over the course of the novel. Many critics, however, would rather choose Heathcliff and be cast out of heaven under the delusion of heroic rebellious romance in the form of self-deluded heroic rebellion instead of being transformed by the forgiving love that transfigures Kathy and brings redemption to all of Withering Heights. By cutting off Kathy's transfiguration and redemption of the land by focusing only on Catherine and Heathcliff, we miss the true power and majesty of Emily Bronte's sublime novel and that enduring reminder that forgiveness is truly the hardest, most heroic, most loving reality we can manifest in our lives. The story of Withering Heights is not a celebration of the love of Catherine and Heathcliff, as we've been force-fed by indoctrination over the last 100 years of cultural interpretations of this wonderful, this truly wonderful novel. Emily Bronte's real message is that in the midst of lust, death, sin, and destruction, all the things that Heathcliff himself manifests, that the power of loving forgiveness can undo it all and bring back beauty and life to the world.